physical disability and classifications to classification, how it is different from adult and how it is different in from the developed countries to the Indian settings. So, uh, so I'll start with the presentation. So, the outline is like a initial brief discussion about anatomy. What is the current problem status of pediatric stroke? What kind of pediatric strokes we are seeing? What are the risk factors? What are the mimics of stroke in children? And some case-based discussions and diagnostic lags and thrombolysis in pediatric stroke. So, uh, just a second. Just a second, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so coming to the definitions initially, what is stroke? So stroke, according to WHO, is defined as rapidly developing clinical signs and symptoms of focal and global disturbances of cerebral function lasting for more than 24 hours or leading to death with no apparent cause other than vascular region. So this definition is very important. We have to understand this definition that it should be rapid. It should be clinical and signs and symptom, which should be lasting for more than 24 hours to diagnose a stroke. And it should be explainable with the vascular origin. So stroke is very common. So if we look in the incidence in the adult, it is about 130 cases per 1 lakh population per year. So very high incidence in adults. However, uh, so initially I'll go with the uh, anatomy of blood circulation. Then I'll go with the specific to pediatric stroke. So if we divide the cerebral circulation, it is uh, divided into anterior circulation and posterior circulation. And this is the circle of Willis, which we know is the main uh, sub main the arterial blood supply of the brain. It is formed by two uh, internal carotid arteries. And uh, in the posterior circulation, we have basilar artery, which is formed by joining two vertebral arteries. So these are the uh, predominant circulation. So almost 80% of the brain is supplied by the anterior circulation and 20% is supplied by the posterior circulation. So it, this anatomy is very important for us to know, to localize the clinical signs symptoms according to the brain area supplied and to localize which artery is probably involved in the uh, yeah. causation of stroke. So these are the vascular territories, a uh, brief overview of the uh, brain, part of the brain supplied by anterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, and middle cerebral artery. So we can see predominant part of the brain is supplied by MCA. Midline parasagittal area is supplied by ACA. Midline parasagittal area posteriorly supplied by PCA. And this is the central part of the brain is supplied by uh, lenticulostriate branches uh, from the anterior choroidal artery posterior circulation, middle cerebral artery, and anterior cerebral artery. So this picture we have to keep in mind when we see the clinical images or radiology just to localize where our patient's stroke is lying. And similarly, the posterior part of brain is supplied by the posterior circulation. So we can see the midbrain is supplied by branches of basilar artery, pons is supplied by branches of vertebral artery, and cerebellum is supplied by three important vessels, that is ica, pica, and superior cerebral artery. So upper part of the uh, yeah. cerebellar hemisphere supplied by superior cerebral artery, part anterior part is supplied by ICA and the posterior lowermost part like tonsillar area and flocculus is supplied by pica. So this uh, picture we have to keep in mind when we see the radiology just to compare where our patient's uh, involvement lies. So some difference between the small vessel and large vessel stroke. So large vessel stroke, we say when there is an involvement of large vessels that is MCA, ACA, ICA and on the vertebral and basilar artery. So the most common site of involvement is uh, middle cerebral artery among stroke. And most of the large vessel stroke are occlusion of the large arteries. So they lead to large areas of infarct and these are usually wedge-shaped lesion. So the in MCA, we have involvement of uh, several segments in the MCA. So we can see uh, this is an ICA, this is op uh, ophthalmic artery. And after ICA, uh, the MCA goes from this segment to uh, in the horizontal part in the uh, along the circle of Willis. So this one called M1 segment. When the MCA turns into the, uh, in the sylvian fissure, we call this is as M2 segment. And when it turns from the sylvian fissure to the cortical areas, we call this is M3 segment. So M3 segment can be supplied, supplying the frontoparietal or this is a part of temporal lobe inferiorly. So uh, this is how we classify the stroke of uh, middle cerebral artery. So where they which part of the brain is mostly probably affected and which segment of the MC can be affected. And these are the small lenticulostriate branches, which predominantly supplies the basal ganglia, thalamus, caudate, and carpus callosal area. So uh, clinical features of stroke in children depends which area of part of the brain is involved. And it also depends whether the dominant or non-dominant hemisphere is involved. 
However, in infants and children, we know that they can be non-specific at time. Like it could be just encephalopathy, irritability, uh, mutism, or aphasia. Usually, they are not diagnosed in children, so we have to uh, see that sometimes the presentation can be non-specific and they are not identified. Uh, sometimes the presentation can be just because of raised ICP and mast defect. We just have obtundation, coma, signs of herniation, hyperventilation. And we have to see that children with a, uh, acute ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke can have similar presentation. However, focality is more common in AIS and diffuse presentation is more common in pediatric hemorrhagic stroke. So the clinical features of pediatric stroke can be uh, like in ischemic stroke, we predominantly see a focal neurological sign that is hemiparesis in 50 to 90% patients. Otherwise, we can also see monoparesis, cranial nerve palsy, ataxia, aphasia, visual field loss. So I want to say that in children, uh, aphasia, visual field loss, this, these are difficult to uh, uh, identify during the acute phase. And sometimes the presentation is febrile. So we just think that it is a febrile encephalopathy. And we cannot identify presence of aphasia and visual field loss in this case because of lack of cooperation or presence of encephalopathy. Seizures, focal seizures are equally common presentation of pediatric stroke. And any on, new onset encephalopathy can be a indication of a stroke in children. And however, hemorrhagic stroke presents with more diffuse signs. So you have headache, vomiting, raised ICP. If your uh, child is kind of older enough, so then you can detect the focal signs, visual field defects. Otherwise, more diffuse sign and diffuse encephalopathy is more common with CSVT and hemorrhagic stroke. So what we have to uh, remember that the onset of deficits in stroke is sudden and it is very severe at the maximum and then it tend to improve gradually. So this is the hallmark of uh, deficits in a uh, stroke patient. So this is a mnemonic which is uh, used in adult patient that is fast. If you have a like facial deviation, if his arm is like weak and dangling and there is a motor aphasia or incomprehension, then it is a, they are the signs of a stroke in adult and it is uh, you have to uh, act immediately. But these signs and symptoms are very uh, less easily identifiable in children and usually the stroke diagnosis is delayed in pediatric patients. So we should consider a stroke or consider imaging in patients who have new onset focal seizures, new onset severe headache, uh, altered mental status, including TIAs or transient loss of consciousness or behavioral changes, vision loss, unilateral or new onset ataxia, vertigo, dizziness, or sometimes neck pain or neck stiffness can be seen in children with dissections. And uh, sometimes TIAs can also be seen because uh, by definition, stroke should be, deficit should be lasting for more than 24 hours. However, sometimes the infarcts are associated with TIA and then these uh, symptoms are usually rapidly resolving. So these are also indication for imaging in these kids. So this is the classical uh, imaging pattern. If we can see, this is the uh, midline parasagittal area involvement. And this is the typical hypodensity in CT scan, which you see after 24 hours of the onset of stroke. So this is a typical ACA involvement. And this is for uh, basic, these lights are for our residents so that they can have an impression that what kind of radiology looks like in patients with stroke. So these are established stroke patients. Sometimes radiology may not be this classical when we see patients in the uh, initial 24 hours or within very early in the stroke, but uh, for residents sake, this is the pattern of involvement. So this is an MC involvement where you can see there is involvement of caudate, putamen and there is a part of large cerebral hemisphere involvement and there is a sparing of occipital area. And this is an involvement in the uh, complete IC occlusion where you can see this parasitical midline area is also involved so that AC and MC are involved together in these patients along with midline involvement along with caudate as well as putamen. So this is a, these are the typical example of large vessel stroke, established stroke and we see hypodensity in the CT scans. So now coming to pediatric stroke, actually pediatric stroke is rare in comparison to adult, but as such, they are not very uncommon. So we see these patients in emergency room presenting with and diagnosed as something like more stroke mimic or uh, febrile encephalopathy. So the incidence is six per one lakh children. This is the data from Canadian Stroke Registry. However, if we include children and neonate both, the incidence goes to very high. So approximately 25 cases per one lakh uh, if we see if neonates are also included. And the stroke has a high mortality, about five to 10% children tend to die. And about two thirds of these children require uh, continuous neurological care because of persistent disabilities and uh, epilepsy. 
So uh, this is a stroke classification. We can have ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. The proportion is about 60 to 40 percent. And uh, ischemic stroke is further divided into arterial ischemic stroke, and that could be anterior circulation as well as posterior circulation. So uh, if we compare the risk factor in pediatrics and adult, if we see the adult, what the common risk factor are that is pretty known to us that atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, dyslipidemia, these are the risk factors. However, in comparison to adult, if we see the risk factor in pediatrics are highly variable. So there are arteriopathies, congenital heart disease, infection, head and neck disorder, systemic disorder, hematological and prothrombotic state. So that's why pediatric stroke is unique in comparison to adults. So in adult, you have fixed kind of risk factor and can have uh, uniform protocols for the stroke. However, in pediatrics, they are much more variable. So it's important to know stroke mimics in children because they are equally common. If you see the such studies uh, of uh, incidence of stroke in ER, you see 50% patients have stroke mimic and 50% tend to have uh, actual stroke. So we should know about what are the stroke mimics which can present in the emergency settings. So my presentation is based on uh, some case-based discussion just to have that idea how these children actually present rather than just having text-based discussion. So in this case, uh, uh, these are actual cases which we have seen uh, over the years in the emergency room. Shivan can also memorize these cases because several of them he has also seen. So uh, this is a nine-month-old child who present with acute onset fever with multiple right-sided focal seizure and status epilepticus. And uh, she was continued to have seizures. And after 48 hours with ongoing seizure, she was admitted to us. And an examination, you see she had right hemiparesis as well as aphasia. So uh, this was the uh, T2-weighted MRI of this child. So we can see this. Uh, there is a, a T2 hypointensity uh, hypo intensities within the occipital lobe. And if you look at the diffusion weighted images, there was complete diffusion restriction in one of the hemisphere, including the carpus callosum. I have not included that section, but there's a complete hemispheric uh, diffusion restriction with involvement of carpus callosum. So this is an HHE syndrome, pretty common scenario in ER where there is a uh, infant or child with febrile seizure, prolonged status and develops hemiparesis and aphasia. So also known as HHE syndrome. This is hemiconvulsion, hemiplasia, and epilepsy syndrome. And this is because of prolonged seizure leading to uh, breach in the broadband barrier, increasing permeability as well as cytotoxic edema. So this is one stroke mimic. Another stroke mimic I just want to show that is a three-year-old female child who present who had multiple episodes of weakness. So at nine months, she has a right focal seizure with hemiparesis, which is solved. At 12 months, she had left-sided seizure with hemiparesis, which revolved in, resolved into 48 to 72 hours. And now at three years, she comes again with the right-sided weakness for 48 hours. She has mild delay in motor milestones. And on examination, she had right hemiparesis. And this was the image of this child. So we can see this looks like absolutely normal image. So this is a stroke mimic. So what is the diagnosis here? We did an angiography, which was normal. Metabolic workup was normal. Cardiovascular workup was normal. And this, we got this history when from the mother that the weakness improves in sleep. So sleep in sleep, there is no positive movement and she has the positive movement whenever she awakes. So, uh, so we had diagnosis of repeated uh, hemiparesis on alternate side. So we kept the possibility of alternating hemiplasia of infancy. And this was uh, confirmed genetically. This is an autosomal dominant disease with uh, mutation in ATP 1A3 gene. So treatment is usually different and it is responsive to funanazine and to pyramide. Some of other stroke mimics which you can see in OPD is uh, Dyke davidoff mason syndrome where there is a insult in the infantile or fetal period and you can see presentation like hemiplegic cerebral palsy. And you see there is a hemispheric atrophy with the thickening of the ipsilateral bones and sinuses. Uh, so this is uh, features of Dyke davidoff mason syndrome, more commonly in children with you see in follow-up with hemiplegia. So other stroke mimics are like you common are tots paresis, sometimes viral encephalitis like herpes, uh, ADEM, press, migraine, alternating hemiplegia of infancy, and hypoglycemia. So these are the common stroke mimics which we see in uh, emergency settings. So now coming to the risk factors of uh, arterial ischemic stroke in pediatrics. So, uh, so these are the some of the categories which we should remember. The most common category is arteriopathies, and second category is cardiac, 
prothrombotic states, hematological disorder, sometimes drugs or medications and others. So, uh, so, so the peculiar thing in about in ischemic stroke is that these are not exclusive diagnosis. So one patient can have several of the risk factor presence together in a, a single case. So sometimes arteriopathy along with uh, can present in presence of hematological disorder or prothrombotic state. So these are not exclusive. So we need to think that several of the risk factor can be present together in these patients. So now coming to the uh, individual risk factor, the most common one is arteriopathy. So arteriopathies are usually uh, divided into several categories. So I'll take few of the cases of arteriopathies. So uh, here is a five-year-old boy who comes with acute onset fever, right hemiparesis, uh, typical history, febrile encephalopathy. On examination, you find there is a right hemiparesis. And CSF was done, which shows thousand cells, which are polymorphs, and culture was positive for Neisseria meningitis. And because of hemorrhage, uh, hemiplasia, and uh, it was a complicated meningitis case, and MR was done at day 10 of fever. So we can see that there is an involvement of left sided uh, hemisphere with predominant involvement of interior frontal lobe. And, and this kind of image you can see that there is a wedge shaped involvement in this area, and you have cortical things, uh, cortical involvement. So this is very characteristic of subacute. Uh, involvement of vessels. So if you have large vessel which are occluded suddenly, you have wedge shaped infarct with lots of swelling. And this pattern is typically seen when you have a progressive arteriopathy where there is a gradual ischemia. So there is involvement of more involvement of corticus and subcortical white, white matter area. And in angiography, we see there is a, uh, this is the normal right-sided uh, ICA as well as MCA. And you see this, there is a thinning of this MC on the left side, as well as thinning of ACA, as well as you see there is a thinning of ICA also. And this is because this is a top images of MRI and if a blood vessel, uh, blood flow reduced in any part of the circulation, the, uh, the lower part also shows reduction in the flow. So that's why this ICA is also reduced and we have this thinning of MCA. So this is a vasculopathy in presence of meningitis. So and there are some collaterals. So this is a case of few collaterals with large vessel vasculopathy in presence of a bacterial infection. So uh, coming to cerebral arteriopathy, that was an example of infection associated arteriopathy. So cerebral arteriopathy is the most common cause of stroke in children and more than 50% of pediatric strokes are secondary to arteriopathies. And usually they are diagnosed with the MR angiography or vessel wall imaging. And arteriopathy is further classified into several of the subtypes. So uh, uh, this is the Western data from the developed country. So this is a data from IPSS study. Uh, so they have defined their uh, classified as arteriopathies and they found that dissection was the most common. Uh, equally common was the Moya Moya disease and equally common was the focal cerebral arteriopathy. And they divided focal cerebral arteriopathy in uh, three subcategories, that is FCAI, FCA, uh, Dice, uh, diffuse cerebral vasculitis and non-specific arteriopathy. So, so this is according to IPSS. So their their etiologies may be different from us, but we what we see is more common presence of infection associated arteriopathies, moya moya, and dissection. And also FC is also an emerging etiology of stroke with advent in the diagnostic facilities with the MR angiography and vessel wall imaging. More and more cases of FC are being diagnosed now. So typical FCA is more common between uh, six to nine years of age and typical arteriopathy presentation is uh, repeated episodes of TIA and stroke. And the onset in arteriopathy, we should remember that it is not very hyperacute onset. So it is kind of a stuttering course uh, with the progressive and stuttering symptoms. And there may be multiple areas in the brain are involved and recurrent symptoms are seen, either TIA or recurrent strokes. And these arteriopathies are classified in the several uh, subtypes based on your uh, etiopathology, like you divide them infection, non-infection, unilateral or bilateral, large vessel or small vessel. So more common one is the secondary arteriopathies. So among them infection, that bacterial meningitis, uh, streptococcal pneumonia, uh, nizaria, these are all associated with vasculopathy. Uh, other important cause is tubercular meningitis, which is uh, in about 40%, it is associated with large artery strokes and in many more percentages associated with small vessel arteriopathies. Uh, other rare causes are fungal meningitis and HIV. Uh, in systemic inflammatory disorders like uh, uh, Takayasu, 
polyarthritis nodosa, DADA2 associated mutation, SLEKD, we also see uh, cerebral vasculitis. And if we don't have any uh, cause to explain, like infection or systemic uh, inflammatory disorder, and usually these are uh, cases of primary CNS angitis. So coming to a case now, he's a seven-year-old boy who presents with acute febrile illness for 10 days with the fever, headache, and vomiting with right-sided focal seizure on day five of illness. On examination, you have right-sided facial weakness as well as hemiparesis, and he receives ceftriaxone for seven days outside because of this acute uh, febrile illness with the focal deficits outside. So uh, this was his image when he came to us. So we can see that he had involvement of uh, this basal ganglia area in the putaminal area and mild leptomeningeal enhancement was also seen. So we have also considered diagnosis of a meningitis possibly or tubercular meningitis with stroke. And CSF was done, which showed 50 cells, lymphocytic uh, protein sugars was normal, gene expert was negative, culture was sterile, and he was treated with ATT, aspirin, as well as uh, completed seven, 10 days of antibiotics. So when we did this MR angiography, there was isolated involvement of MCA. And rapidly CSF become acellular, and vessel wall imaging uh, in this index patient showed uh, normal ICA, normal MCA, ACA, but there was a narrowing of M2 segment of the uh, middle cerebral artery. And subsequently, we considered a diagnosis of uh, focal cerebral arteriopathy, possibly triggered with the aseptic meningitic process. And vessel wall imaging showed this kind of involvement with uh, intermittent stenosis and irregular uh, outline of the MCA. So a diagnosis of FCA was considered in this child. and. Uh, so the treatment of FCA is also debatable. So let's see what FCA or transient cerebral arteriopathies are. So these are unilateral focal stenosis of large intracranial arteries. Uh, large means we should have involvement of MCA, ACA or uh, PCA. And typically MRI shows small areas of infarct, which are cortical or subcortical, and they could be multiple. And typically, these involve large or medium sized vessels, and usually they have viral trigger, and which is the most typical and uh, common is a varicella. And we call them transient if we demonstrate there is a no progression on improvement by six month radiology. And if they remain stable or there is no progression, we call them FC or transient cerebral arteriopathy. And uh, if you have progression, which can occur in about uh, six to 10 percent cases, then there is a chances of recurrent strokes is there. And uh, follow-up radiology may show improvement or stabilization or resolution in most of the cases. About uh, 5 to 10% patients can show a progressive arteriopathy. So then these are diagnosed as uh, angiography positive, primary progressive cerebral arteriopathies. And the treatment of choice in these cases is usually antithrombotic agent, that is antiplatelet agents. And a short course of steroid with tapering over next two to three months is given for these cases. So this is a kind of debatable, not much evidence is for there, but it has been seen in series that that uh, steroid, uh, if given steroids, their outcomes are better in follow-up. So uh, another case, uh, this is a seven year female, which comes with two episodes of seizures and encephalopathy. On examination, she had this kind of healed and scab lesions of various uh, at uh, her trunk as well as abdomen and facial areas. And she had left hemiparesis and left -sided, right sided facial palsy. Uh, there was no meninial signs. She came in a comatose uh, state. So she went to PICU. CSF was done, which was acellular. And there was a history of this uh, varicella 20 days back with multiple lesions. So uh, because of her hemiparesis and uh, facial palsy, uh, involvement of the pontine area or midbrain was uh, localized. And if we see that there is a, she has involvement of the posterior circulation predominantly. So there was involvement of uh, uh, midbrain on the right side, as well as involvement of cerebellar hemispheres with the diffusion restriction in these images. And there was some micro hemorrhages in SWI images was also there. And the vessel uh, MR angiography in these patient. Uh, so this, these are the uh, ICA in the neck. And this is the basal artery. So we can see there was an interruption in the basal artery here. And 
uh, there was irregularity and narrowing in the posterior circulation. So this is a superior cerebral artery and this is a uh, posterior and inferior cerebellar artery. So in a larger view, we can see these are irregularly narrowed as well as uh, thinning is there and some uh, area of dilatation is also seen. So this was a case of uh, post varicella arteriopathy with the posterior circulation stroke with involvement of large artery as well as uh, medium sized arteries and her varicella CSR PCR was positive and IgM was also positive. So uh, some uh, uh, about post varicella angiopathy, it can be seen in both immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients and usually it is a multifocal uh, vasculopathy and it tend to involve small and large arteries uh, in 50% cases, but there could be isolated small or large arteries can be involved. And uh, angiography typically shows segmental areas of narrowing with post dilatation. And if your uh, angiography is negative, like if you can see, cannot see involvement of large arteries or medium sized arteries, then it doesn't rule out the presence of angiopathy. You can have a small vessel involvement in uh, infarcts. And uh, diagnosis is usually supported by presence of varicell IgG and or CSF PCR. And usually they are treated with the short course of acyclovir for 14 days. This is also not like evidence-based therapy, but uh, uh, some literature suggests that oral steroid given for a short course helps and they should be treated with initially with acyclovir and followed by oral valgancyclovir for two to three months. So uh, this was a case of, uh, like I told you, we have discussed about the arterio, we are discussing arteriopathy. So infection associated at arteriopathy, uh, focal cerebral arteriopathy, post varicella angiopathy, and now some of the cases of another few another types of arteriopathy which we are seeing commonly so a seven year old girl comes with the history of fever for 10 days and she has acute onset left hemiparesis and encephalopathy for 10 days and at she has previous two episodes of similar illnesses with febrile illness with uh, focal deficit so one was left hemiparesis Another was left hemi right hemiparesis, and this time she comes with the left hemiparesis. Also, she has developmental delay and microcephaly, and she has a recurrence. So, so we see that in historically she has recurrent episode of strokes, which are associated with the febrile illness. So, uh, so this was her MRI. If you see, there is a uh, massive cortical atrophy, caudate atrophy, and there is an involvement of acute uh, swelling in the occipital area. And these are asymmetrical involvement, and these are the areas of uh, cortical ischemia. So this is we call laminar necrosis, which is typically seen in children with Moya Moya disease or vasculopathy when there is a progressive, uh, gradual progressive narrowing of the arteries. So we don't see typical wedge shaped impact as I told you when there is a progressive subacute uh, occlusion. So this is also called IV mark sign in children with Moya Moya disease. And uh, sometimes we diagnose Moya Moya diseases on these base images of uh, uh, basal cuts in the T2 sections, where we see this is the uh, flow void of the basal artery. And if we compare the flow void of basal artery with the uh, flow voids of ICA, we can see this. Uh, there is a very much marked narrowing of the bilateral ICA. Typically, ICA flow voids are larger than the basal artery flow void. So here we cannot see these flow voids. And we see some collaterals in the sylvian fissure. So uh, this was an MR angiography and this is a quite advanced stage of Moya Moya disease where we just can see only posterior circulation, uh, basal and vertebral arteries are present. However, we cannot see presence of MCA or ACA in this case. So uh, this is advanced stage of Moya Moya disease. Uh, this is another image where you can see there is a more, uh, less global involvement and there is a presence of uh, ACA infarct in the left side. So this is a diffusion weighted images and show diffusion restriction. And in angiography, you can see there is a, this is a opposite side ACA, which is nicely visible, but you cannot see ACA on the uh, left side. And also these are the ICA which are narrow and then there is a occlusion of ICA here. So this is a tapering of ICA and there is a loss of flow void here and here also. And subsequently the M3 segment is reformed from the collaterals and these are all uh, like you can see, these are the collaterals which appears like a puff of smoke. So uh, regarding pediatric Moya Moya diseases, the typical clinical presentation in these patients is uh, focal deficit. So this is a Japanese data. So typically they present with ischemic stroke in uh, uh, young children. I mean, adults, they can present with hemorrhagic strokes also. So about 80% presents with the focal deficits. 
uh, there could be encephalopathy or sometimes they present just with headache seizures psychiatric symptom or movement disorder and this is our own series of uh, moya moya disease of uh, 23 this was uh, published uh, uh, quite few years ago when uh, these kids was not routinely taken up for surgery so 95% children used to present with uh, focal deficit seizures 30% can have associated fever as a trigger so trigger we should remember that any kind of exertion hyperventilation excessive cry uh, or hyperventilation during eg can precipitate a stroke in children with uh, moya moya disease so uh, since this is a old series so i just want to say that uh, 87% was initially treated conservatively and only few were uh, taken up for surgery but the scenario is changing now so the diagnostic criteria for uh, uh, moya moya is provided by japanese uh, societies and usually they say the dsa is the gold standard however mr angiography is more commonly used for diagnosis so the diagnosis of moya moya is considered when there is a, a stenosis or occlusion of terminal portion of ica or mc or ac origin and you should have abnormal vascular network in close association with these occluded arteries and they should be bilateral finding but dsa is not a routine uh, kind of investigation which we perform in these patients uh, uh, the diagnosis is based on angiography mr angiography so the criteria remains same but uh, in addition if you have flow voids in the basal ganglia if you can like see more than two flow voids in the basal ganglia then also you can make a diagnosis in presence of these anomaly like uh, occlusion of ic as well as collaterals and for establishing like uh, you have significant hypoperfusion some of these perfusion studies are required like pet scan or acetylcholamide spect to detect hypoperfusion so these are helpful for taking a decision when to operate these kids and usually the treatment is adequate hydration during acute state anti seizure medications headache analgesics for headache and antiplatelet therapy is usually initiated whenever there is a stroke or ti in these patients and it is continued in the post operative phase also just to prevent uh, recurrences but the treatment of choice of these children in is surgery so for the indication of surgery in moya moya is not the first episode of tia there should be repeated clinical symptoms like you have episodes of recurrent tias or uh, in fact or you have radiological evidence of uh, in or repeated involvement like you have multiple infarcts and in uh, perfusion studies you can see there is a if there is a reduced cerebral perfusion then these are the indication for uh, surgery so when to take surgery these are not clear cut guideline not in the immediate stage when you have infarct or swell, swelling in the hemisphere after your acute symptoms has subsided the children are taken up for surgery uh, so some of these uh, uh, syndromes are associated moya moya so these are called uh, moya moya syndrome and if none is there then it is called moya moya disease so most common were are down syndrome sickle cell thal uh, infections like tb hiv or neurocutaneous syndrome these are associated with moya moya syndrome uh, so this is uh, our new slide given by our neurosurgeon so uh, 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 we have a, a moya moya surgery team so approximately 65 pediatric moya moya cases has been treated and most common modality is st mca Uh, anastomosis so that is direct anastomosis of st and mca so superior temporal artery and mca is directly end to end anastomosis is then and it is supplemented with the indirect vascularization like you place a flap of uh, muscle or dura to improve the vascularization so uh, no further tias are noted after uh, surgery in these patients and uh, usually they tend to become of uh, uh, ads and anti uh, platelet agent are usually continued in these patient and usually uh, it is a stage procedure so unilateral followed by bilateral surgeries are performed and after that we tend to uh, taper uh, aspirin in these patients so now coming to another one uh, important entity which is present in specifically in this part of uh, 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 world which is uh, seen in our country especially so 8 month old girl child who just developmentally normal and she had a history of trivial head trauma while she was running she just fell and and after that mother has noticed that she developed a left hemiparesis as well as some twisting posture of both the hands and she was irritable after that fall so uh, this is a ct scan on day 1 in which we can see there is a bilateral basal ganglia showing some uh, linear kind of hyperdensities and and subsequent ct shows there is a uh, hypodensity in bilateral basal ganglia so 
uh, they can be taken as hemorrhage also, but you can see these uh, lesions are more linear and uh, there is no mass effect and all that. So these are typical uh, calcification in the basal ganglia. So uh, subsequent MR angiography, uh, sorry, MRI brain confirms there is a lacunar infarct in bilateral basal ganglia and angiography is normal in these kids. So this entity is known as mineralizing vasculopathy of childhood. So this is a distinct uh, uh, etiology. And usually these children suffer uh, stroke in the basal ganglia after a minor trauma. And usually these are toddlers. And CT shows uh, uh, linear mineralization in the bilateral endocleostriate vessels. So this is described from India only, from the South India initially. Uh, so uh, this is a very famous paper from Dr. Lokesh Lingappa, who described 23 infants with basal ganglia infarcts and lentoclostride mineralization. So they present with hemiparesis after fall or dystonia. And uh, uh, they have reported recurrence in few of these cases, but most of our case, cases tend to remain uh, normal after that. And uh, workup for like proposed etiology for hyperparathyroidism or IU infection, these are negative in these cases. So this is an under-recognized entity and it is almost completely absent from the Western literature. So this is a very specific form which is seen in our country. And few cases from Turkey, Pakistan has been reported. And it is a common form of stroke uh, in our country. And so if we do only MRI, then these calcifications are only missed and we cannot label these patients as a mineralized vasculopathy. And usually these are uh, not diagnosed or diagnosed as a metabolic stroke or uh, something else. So this is our paper about childhood basal ganglia stroke in association with trivial head trauma. And uh, we see that 74% kids had a history of trauma and nine cases has not, uh, no, no history of trauma could be elicited. And usually these kids tend to recover uh, completely during follow. So uh, one more case of, uh, again, a uh, very peculiar entity for pediatric cases. So a one and a half year old boy who was running with the pencil in his mouth and he ran and he fall in his uh, uh, forehead. And then he brought to us with the history of left-sided weakness and focal seizure. On examination, you found there is a left hemiparesis and also there is a right-sided ptosis as well as meiosis in this patient. So he was diagnosed as a case of left hemiparesis with right-sided Horner syndrome. So we can localize due to presence of Horner syndrome in this case that there is an involvement of IC in the neck. Uh, uh, typically, this occurs because of trauma of ICA in the tonsillar fossa and uh, you developed uh, uh, dissection in that particular area. So he had this involvement of MCA, a uh, large portion, as well as uh, uh, we could see that there was a dissection in the left ICA in the tonsillar fossa and uh, so, so this is a kind of, uh, this is a normal uh, ICA which is visible in the neck, but in this case there was a, this involvement of and there was a reduced in the lumen and there was a flap in this patient. So this was the diagnosis here. So, uh, so this is a case of dissection because of traumatic pathology. So usually these cases of dissections are treated with the anticoagulation. And usually three to six months of coagulation is required. And you do a repeat uh, uh, angiography just to see that these are healed. And once there is a partial healing uh, after three months or six months, then the anticoagulation is usually stopped. So initially, we treat them with the low molecular weight heparin. And subsequently, we keep them on LMW if there is an infant or then oral uh, vitamin K antagonists are used. Again, uh, interesting case, uh, this case with the road traffic accident. Uh, admitted in neurosurgery and uh, where it, he presented with seizures and encephalopathy following a road traffic accident. And uh, uh, subsequently, he was noticed to have hemiparesis once he little uh, recovered from encephalopathy. And uh, this uh, we have identified this sign in this patient that there was a, this uh, uh, hyperdensity in the CT scan in the sylvian fissure. And there was a uh, some hemorrhage here and hypodensity in the right uh, right sided uh, putaminal area. So this was uh, diagnosed query SAH or query dense MCA sign. So this was a case of uh, dissection of left MCA following a road traffic accident. So this is also known entity. So uh, subsequent MR angiography confirms the presence of irregularity in the MCA uh, in the M1 segment and there was a flap 
and this was a, a t1 hyper intensity just because presence of clot and there was an infarct in the uh, subcortical white ventre and adjacent uh, putaminal area and this was the dissection here so post traumatic dissection is also common in kids and usually they are missed in the initial period because they presence with encephalopathy and uh, uh, seizures so later on they are identified to have a stroke so uh, what is dissection? It is a tear of intimal layer of artery. Uh, so if there is a tear, there is a greater deposition and secondary activation of clotting cascade. And it is an important cause of stroke in children. Uh, several of the studies show 7.5%, but it is more common in the posterior circulation area. And usually we see in adolescent males with head and neck trauma or connective tissue disorder, they present with the posterior circulation stroke. Uh, diagnosis is usually confirmed by CT angiography or DSA or uh, they can be suspected in MR angiography with T1 fat set and contrast images are required to diagnose. And uh, vertebral artery involvement in C1, C2 region is unique, especially in the boys where there is a, a lot of uh, neck movement or rotational uh, injuries are there. So this area develops an, uh, pseudo aneurysm and dissection and you develop, uh, kids tend to develop posterior circulation stroke because of recurrent uh, thrombotic dislodgement and uh, in the basal artery and you develop stroke in the pontine and basal pontine area and uh, cerebellum, uh, cerebellar area. So elner danlos syndrome and uh, these connective tissue disorders can predispose. So one more case, uh, he's 11 year old boy, he was athlete and he was doing headstand and developed episode of dizziness and subsequently he developed left hemiparesis and left cerebral signs were noticed on examination, echo and Doppler was normal. So a posterior circulation was stroke was considered secondary to dissection. So in kids with dissection, we immediately start them on LMWH once a hemorrhage is ruled out. So he had a left hemispheric involvement with the left-sided uh, uh, cerebellar hemisphere as well as uh, 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 tract involvement and there was a diffusion restriction in the particular area. So this was a posterior circulation stroke and he had specific involvement of left-sided uh, superior cerebellar artery. So this was a dissection. So, uh, so posterior circulation stroke is a uh, little bit different in terms of etiology from the anterior circulation. And most common site of involvement is usually vertebral arteries. And in our pediatric 24 posterior circulation stroke cases, we see that uh, about 40% has dissection because of rotatory anomalies or anatomical uh, instability at the CV junction. And, uh, and they present with raised intracranial pressure. And sometimes it think Moyamoya disease can also involve the posterior circulation, but it, not, it will not be alone posterior. So it is associated with anterior and posterior circulation strokes. Uh, so this is a case of uh, cyanotic heart disease. In a cyanotic spell, she develops a weakness of right upper limb and lower limb and on examination right hemiparesis and this is acute thromboembolic stroke secondary to uh, cardiac cyanotic heart disease. So this is another most important group, almost 15 to 20 percent uh, cases in pediatric stroke series are secondary to uh, heart disease. So most common are cyanotic heart disease, but we do see with the uh, uh, DCM or infective endocarditis. And sometimes we see this uh, complication during procedures also. So this 10 month old girl was admitted for PDA ligation and during uh, uh, catheter angiography, she uh, uh, developed the femoral artery thrombosis and IV streptokinase was given for local lysis and she developed uh, uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So this kind of complications we also do see in addition to ischemic stroke. So this we have published our uh, data about ischemic stroke collected in 2017 to 18 and we published our series and what we are reported that the most common cause of uh, risk, uh, risk factor for ischemic stroke was arteriopathy in our cohort, that was 77%, followed by an underlying heart disease. And most of these are infection-associated arteriopathy, mineralizing angiopathy, and myoma disease. So uh, this is the etiological uh, comparison of uh, our cases versus what is published from the Western literature from uh, Great Ormond Street or Netherlands. So uh, arteriopathy remains the most common cause. And uh, uh, in Western country, it is usually the post varicella angiopathy or Moyamoya disease. However, in our country, we can see varied etiology. So you have mening bacterial meningitis, tubercular meningitis, post varicella angiopathy, and mineralizing angiopathy is very unique to our country. 
other we see uh, dissection as well as and heart disease in other risk important group of uh, risk factor and uh, other or they may be associated uh, prothrombotic or hematological disorders so like 70 percent of our kids has associated iron deficiency anemia or depending on the epidemiology sometimes sickle or thal are also common in these patients and one more important is hyperhomocysteinemia because of presence of b12 deficiency in these kids now coming to few of the important questions so what should be the imaging modalities in pediatric stroke so uh, so i know uh, uh, infants uh, usg dopplers are also used but uh, typical imaging uh, modality is ct because it is easy and rapid but it can miss uh, ischemic stroke in first 24 hours in approximately 60% cases so mr with mr injury remains a uh, investigation of choice uh, because it can delineate infarct, it can delineate hemorrhage. Uh, you can have uh, vessel wall imaging or MR angiography along with. But the problem is that you require anesthesia as well as it is a not uh, easily uh, available or round the clock available facility. So uh, recent guidelines suggest that if you uh, your patient presents within first few hours, like within four hours, you go for a CT brain with CT angiography. But if you are out of the window, then go for MRI and MR angiography. So regarding the management, uh, so we know that the time is brain. So for management of these patients, everything should be you. So there should be airway, breathing, circulation management. There is you, oxygen should be maintained, fluid, glucose, and electrolyte balance should be maintained. Severity assessments can be done, pediatric NIH score, and treatment of hypotension, hypotension, and seizures becomes of uh, very important. And uh, so uh, there should not be delay in uh, identification and treatment of children with stroke. So uh, in the acute management of ischemic stroke in a CT scan or uh, first modality is usually a CT scan. So if you don't find an hemorrhage, put them on antiplatelet or anticoagulation. And uh, the uh, decision between antiplatelet and anticoagulation is based on uh, some evidence that if you have a, like heart disease or dissection where there is a more... Uh, coagulation factor is working. So LMW is to be started and otherwise in arteriopathy is usually the aspirin is started, but there is no head to head trials in these patients. So the policies vary. Some of the Western literature suggests that initially for four or five days, you put them on LMWH and then you convert them to aspirin. So dose of aspirin is 5 mg per kg uh, for 14 days initially, and then you convert it to one to three mg per kg as secondary profile axis. And uh, uh, sickle or thal, you have to maintain the blood uh, hemoglobin above 10. And sometimes exchange transfusions are required here if HBS is high. And regarding thrombolysis, uh, we'll discuss it in the some subsequent slides. And uh, secondary prevention, because risk uh, recurrence risk is about 10% in pediatric stroke cases. So usually an anti-thrombotic agent is given for two to five years, depending on what risk factor you identify. So aspirin at one to three mg per kg is given. Uh, hydration has to be maintained. Anticoagulation is given during acute phase and subsequently it is converted into oral anticoagulants or aspirin. And uh, uh, usually LMWH is preferred because of it uh, doesn't require much of the monitoring. But in case you have a large hemorrhage or malignant infarct, Sometimes conventional heparin is required when you have uh, issues of decompressive craniotomy when there is a rapid reversal is required. So now one other peculiar problem with the stroke diagnosis in our country or say it's worldwide for the pediatric stroke. So median time from symptom onset to medical care from the parental side is six hours. So you can see from 1.7 to 21 hours is the time required for identification of stroke symptoms and approaching to a physical physician. And mean time to radiological confirmation is 15 to 24 hours. So, so there is a considerable delay in the diagnosis of pediatric stroke. So we cannot talk about the time window because our patients are reaching late to us. And the delay is because uh, stroke is not considered as a differential diagnosis initially. Uh, access to MRI and geography is delayed in these patients. And these kids require sedation anesthesia uh, for MRI and geography. And delay is more in the weekends or evening when there is a... Uh, there is no uh, neurologist or expertise are available. So uh, hyperacute therapies in child pediatric stroke is also emerging area. But uh, what I will say that uh, uh, three approaches are there. That is intravenous TPA, intra-arterial TPA or endovascular uh, thrombectomy uh, 
uh, is given. So intravenous TPA is usually given up to 4.5 hours in selected cases. Intra-arterial TPA can be used in six hours and hyperacute therapy with the endovascular thrombectomy can be done up to uh, 24 hours. Uh, so this is based on the hypothesis that uh, if there is a no established ischemic injury, if you intervene early, then the perfusion can help in salvaging the adjacent area. But after four to six hours, when you have ischemic, established ischemic injury, uh, uh, recanalization is not really helpful. It can lead to secondary worsening with hemorrhages or uh, reperfusion injury. So, uh, so this was uh, uh, this was studied in uh, feasibility of uh, thrombolysis was studies in in the TIP study, which was uh, conducted across USA, and 0.9 mg per kg dose was used, and what could they enrolled over the years was only 35 cases. And uh, so the role of uh, hyperacute therapy remains controversial in chill, but uh, recently the evidence is emerging. So in uh, little older kids, selected cases who are within the window and you have a large artery which can be uh, intervened with catheter can be taken up for uh, intravenous or TP or more commonly with, I think, in a pediatric mode, thrombectomy has a more role because you have a larger uh, windows for these kids. So, uh, uh, so I just conclude here that uh, diagnosis of stroke in pediatrics is uh, uh, delayed I mean, most of the time and high index of suspicion is required. So you have to think stroke because if you think stroke, then only you can suspect and diagnose a stroke. And stroke mimics are equally common. And rapid diagnosis is important because that's how you can salvage some of the part of the brain. And the risk factor for stroke are different in pediatrics from the adults, as well as risk factor difference from uh, developed countries also in our country. So uh, what are the most common risk factor if you remember? So infection associated arteriopathies, mineralizing angiopathy, moya moya disease, dissection and heart disease are the most common risk factor. And uh, treatment of stroke varies according to the risk factor identified. And usually the antiplatelet, anticoagulant therapy are the mainstay of therapy right now. And supportive care is equally important in these kids. So I just end my uh, presentation here. And uh, thank, thank you, you, Shivan, for this opportunity given. So thank you, I think I've just for... taken complete one hour for the... <laughs> we're, very, we're, we're very happy that uh, uh, this topic was chosen by you so that... Uh, I don't think anyone would, could have covered uh, stroke so beautifully well. Uh, you stressed upon the classification of stroke and then went through those beautiful cases through which you explained each and every etiology probably one would identify through, uh, throughout the uh, period of clinical practice. So thanks, ma'am, for very beautifully elucidating. Uh, I would now, uh, at this point of time, I would like to welcome uh, Professor G. Kumaresan, sir, and Professor Lima, ma'am, who have joined us. Uh, uh, Professor G. Kumaresan, sir, needs no introduction. For the younger people in our audience, I would like to say that, sir, is, the, is considered the father of pediatric neurology in this part of the country. He is a uh, retired uh, ex-head uh, and uh, uh, the director of pediatric neurology in the Institute of Child Health Egmore and Madras Medical College. Professor Lima, ma'am, is uh, currently the head of pediatric neurology in the Institute of Child Health and Madras Medical College, Chennai. So welcome, sir. Welcome, ma'am. I would like to uh, start with comments from our chairperson. So I'll start with Professor Kumaresan, sir. Sir, your comments on the session and questions, if any, to uh, Dr. Renu, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shivan. It's a good lecture, and I'm extremely happy that you were able to uh, stress on some of the less commonly thought process like the dissection. Many of us as pediatricians may not be aware of the concept of dissection of the arteries. You highlighted that important cause, which is less commonly recognized. A good lecture, beautifully covered, and you have compared the Indian statistics very well with the Western. That is, again, another highlight of your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Lima, ma'am, for your comments and questions, if any. I think ma'am has to unmute. So I'll move uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Arun Mori, sir, for your comments and questions, if any, to the speaker. Yes, sir. Uh, I think we, we will all will agree that this was one of the fantastic uh, talks given. Madam has beautifully covered the entire gamut of pediatric stroke, from the identification of focal deficits and the various differential diagnoses and mimics. So it's really a wonderful, uh, enjoyable lecture, in fact. 
it was really superb thank you all for inviting me into this thank you sir uh, now i request professor uma devi ma'am for your comments and questions if any to the speaker ma'am please no question excellent lecture delivered by dr renu with satar madam uh, you are stressed on the indian uh, this thing mineralizing angiopathy uh, giving guys to infantile this thing uh, uh, very important in our part of uh, this thing and um, the case scenario with which you brought up each and every this thing really excellent madam in a simplified way as well as uh, informative for all the post graduate and um, uh, hematological anemia thalassemia and uh, other hematological problems one has to remember when acutely ill child with stroke comes thank you very much for the opportunity madam congrats <laughs> excellent madam. thank you ma'am uh, i think professor leema ma'am has uh, unmuted ma'am your comments and questions if any to dr renu ma'am evening a uh, very nice lecture i have uh, uh, heard, heard in the later part of the session uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture as she has put it there's a lot of difference between the western literature and our literature the causes are different and again the causes uh, for pediatric stroke as well as for adult stroke are entirely different and she has nicely pointed it out and uh, as she has said that most of the cases for us are uh, transcendental blood gateway that is the infection related myomas and of course mineralizing angiopathy and we do see cases uh, of uh, id that is iron deficiency anemia causing pediatric stroke also and uh, uh, i do not know um, uh, sir will be concurring with me and uh, uh, we do not see that much dissection probably in north india you people are uh, uh, seeing a lot of dissection i do not know Uh, from the institute of uh, child health uh, we have not seen uh, so far uh, any case of dissection and uh, she has nicely pointed out and uh, uh, nicely has uh, given the management also very nice a very nice topic uh, and she has covered the entire gamut thank you thank you ma'am thanks for your comments thank uh, you ma'am now, now i'd request uh, mahesh sir for his uh, comments and questions if any to the speaker sir please thank you very nice lecture excellent lecture uh, detailed based lecture so covered each and every topic related to pediatric stroke especially even you have included thrombolysis also so it is controversial i want to stress that still thrombolysis controversial because number as you pointed out only time to diagnosis number two it has this difference in our model number three you know plasticity so in other words uh, when there is a deficit it may be a dense anemia but children do overcome them with plasticity The geography is very subtle, so still the thrombolysis topic is something that you highlighted very well. Thank you, congrats. Very good lecture. Even even it can be understood even by who even the MRI pictures are still quite interesting. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'd uh, like to start the Q and A section quickly because we have a, a lot of questions and less time remaining with us. Given the popularity of the topic, we have a lot of uh, questions from both PGs and uh, practicing pediatricians. So I'll uh, uh, my questions will be primarily directed to uh, Renu, ma'am, and I'd request uh, the other chairpersons uh, acting as panelists to contribute as and when they feel to by unmuting themselves and speaking into the mic. So you can contribute to any of these questions and offer your views. Ma'am, the first question, which is probably the most frequently asked questions, I see many repetitions in the list, is the um, is about the duration of aspirin. So, is it one year? Is it two years? It is five years? Is it uh, three years, or does it vary up depending on the etiology? So, for arterial ischemic stroke, for the common etiologies, uh, what is the duration of aspirin? The dose you have stressed. So, what will be the duration of aspirin? So, uh, the protocol is usually you start them during acute phase and as a five uh, mg per kg, and then you continue at one to three mg per kg, and the duration varies according to the risk factor you identified. like if you have identified a uh, risk factor as a uh, like uh, dissection so usually the dissection uh, if there is a recanalization by 6 months uh, you sorry i'll just take first the aspirin then i'll go into the lmw part so like if your risk factor is identifies as a uh, fc like focal cerebral arteriopathy so usually the disease progresses or stabilizes by 6 months so in these cases usually a two year therapy is uh, good enough because it's not a kind of ongoing process 
and if you have like risk factor in the mineralizing angiopathy so there's a lots of debate whether to give or uh, give aspirin or not because these are very tiny uh, lenticulocyte vessels so usually aspirin is not uh, given in these kids so the duration varies in uh, according to your etiology but uh, as a uh, rule of thumb if you do not find any etiology so continue aspirin for 2 to 3 years in these kids if you ruled out uh, uh, angio arteriopathies or Uh, heart disease or a prothrombotic state or uh, ida so most of these risk factor are correctable and uh, infection also you correct the uh, you treat the infection and so aspirin is continued for 2 to 3 years uh, usually 2 years if we don't find any kind of risk factor in idiopathic group actually so 2 years generally is uh, given for children with uh, uh, with stroke and arteriopathy and uh, ma'am about uh, trivial trauma leading to stroke and mineralizing angiopathy so uh, do you mean to say that uh, anti antiplatelets are not indicated in these patients ma'am and what is the recurrence risk is another question which someone has asked what is the recurrence risk in mineralizing vasculopathy after trivial trauma and the second question about that is the uh, need and duration of antiplatelet in this particular condition say that uh, uh, not much evidence is there for long term outcome or treatment of these kids this has been recently identified but what the series from south india has reported a recurrence of 5 to 10% in these patients because of again the uh, uh, it is again associated with some trivial trauma or they can be a recurrent small uh, basal ganglia stroke so role of antiplatelet agent is not very clear in these patients so a short duration antiplatelet therapy is usually given but not a longer kind of 2 to 3 years of antiplatelet is warranted but because the pathogenesis itself is uh, not very clear why these arteries are calcified and why they are prone to stroke so uh, so not much uh, like not very clear uh, evidence for continuing long term antiplatelet agents for these uh, entities and in outcome in our cohort is uh, relatively good we have not seen much recurrences in these patients no epilepsy during follow up uh, they recovers uh, pretty good with the uh, res- minimal residual deficits uh, thank you ma'am uh, the next question is on focal cerebral arteriopathy so uh, do you recommend a repeat mri in these patients so once uh, they are diagnosed with focal cerebral arteriopathy in follow up do you recommend an mri if even though they do not have new strokes in the future do you recommend an mri to see whether there is progression or uh, stagnation of the arteriopathy so okay so uh, in the first image itself we can just diagnose an fca but we cannot diagnose them as a primary progressive or uh, transient or what what do we call them non progressive or transient so that that decision only can be taken in a follow up image so after 6 month if your image is showing a resolution or stabilization then you call them a transient cerebral arteriopathy and if they are persistent or progressing then we call them as a progressive arteriopathy and then you have to treat them differently because in a progressive setting they require much more aggressive kind of therapy so uh, the so timing of image is required so it will be required around 6 uh, months of age as you are told would be the ideal time. after 6 months of follow up we should have an image just to uh, oh, yes. to conclude whether it is a transient or it is a, a kind of progressive focal cerebral arteriopathy as i told that almost 90% remain stable or improve but 6 to 10% cases can have a progressive involvement i have a small comment here yes sir please we can uh, we can have a vessel wall imaging no to differentiate whether it is a progressive or a static uh, arteriopathy if it is available in the center if there is a uniform enhancement of the vessel wall one can say that this child is going to somewhat progress and we can have a close follow up whether it's going to have a recurrence in stroke yeah so that will be a good uh, if it is available i agree very vessel important point so vessel wall imaging these days has been done in many centers which can yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. that can give a clue and we can allay the anxiety of the parent because most of the time the parents are asked whether this child will have a recurrence yeah. and that will be of great use to them thank you sir thanks completely for... agree concentric wall thickening as well yeah. as uh, it'll, it'll give concentric... a clue an early clue yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you sir and thank you ma'am uh, the next question is on warfarin in children because uh, warfarin is very commonly used in uh, adults with uh, stroke as an anticoagulant whereas in children we prefer low molecular weight heparin so what is your experience with warfarin in children do you consider them uh, beyond a certain age group 
and how do you dose it do you give a loading dose and then maintenance or uh, uh, do you start it with a maintenance dose only and do you opt a lmwh warfarin switch protocol rather than starting it with a loading dose and giving a maintenance ma'am please so we always follow this protocol of lmw followed by a overlap and then there is a, a overlap of at least 5 to 7 days with warfarin and then we continue with the warfarin so uh, this question about preference of one over other is uh, uh, really a difficult one uh, in acute setting the lmwh is preferred because uh, action of warfarin itself takes some time so in the acute setting we want an immediate anticoagulation so lmwh is uh, preferred but uh, in older kids where there is a, a you can do a repeated monitoring with inr so we put them on uh, warfarin after the acute phase is over and you overlap with the lmw and continue them warfarin but in infants it's really difficult to monitor that kind of inr when we are hardly able to achieve that inr of 2 to 3 in infants so for in these cases uh, we put them on lmwh uh, regular for initial uh, 12 weeks and then we see a image if there is a recanalization or is there then uh, we usually stop at that point of time Ma'am, are there any specific etiologies among all those you have discussed where LMWH is used as the anticoagulant of choice rather than an antiplatelet drug? So that I have uh, mentioned in the slides, uh, dissection is a one setting. Like if you see a large artery dissection either in the posterior circulation or anterior circulation, if you have a clinical clue of like Horner, I have told you, we identify Horner and just we thought that is an ICA involvement is there. So large artery with the traumatic. Uh, injury usually lmwh is preferred and in children with the heart disease uh, one uh, contraindication is infective endocarditis so there we do not uh, put them on uh, lmwh or heparin otherwise for a cardiac and a dissection indication uh, uh, heparin is preferred over uh, aspirin otherwise uh, aspirin is uh, in ar arteriopathies and uh, aspirin is more preferred yes thank you ma'am uh, I see two people having asked the same question about iron deficiency anemia and uh, prothrombotic state and strokes. So I'd like to uh, uh, get your opinion, Renu ma'am, and uh, I'd also uh, request Professor Uma ma'am to give her opinion as a general pediatrician as to is it really a, a, a causative factor for uh, stroke? Do you see in your general practice when you uh, see children with uh, different kinds of arterial or uh, venous uh, stroke and you evaluate for them for prothrombotic states and you do not get anything and you get only iron deficiency anemia. So is this uh, seen in practice and is it a valid uh, risk factor? Because otherwise also iron deficiency anemia is a very common condition or 80% of infants or children below five years of age have iron deficiency anemia in India. So what do you say about that? Uh, Dr. Renu Mam followed by Professor Uma Devi Mam. So as I have told in uh, my uh, the uh, etiology we seen in our kids, so IDA deficiency anemia is a core risk factor in almost 80% kids. So, uh, so alone IDA is kind of uh, very rare, but we do see cases where there is uh, iron deficiency anemia. And uh, in addition, we have, uh, like we commonly see more CSVT in these kids rather than AIS. So you have episodes of diarrheal illness, diarrhea, dehydration, and uh, severe iron deficiency anemia, and we see thrombosis in these kids uh, rather than uh, iron deficiency anemia. But it is a risk factor, and it usually compounds the uh, second trigger. So usually we see two etiologies in these kids if we evaluate for the etiologies. And regarding the prothrombotic state, uh, uh, we see much more common uh, hyperhomocysteinemia uh, as a risk factor. And uh, we do see protein C, protein S deficiency, but the problem is that the uh, age-related cutoffs are less available. And uh, with age, uh, these uh, if really it is a deficient, like below, uh, you have repeat uh, two two time testing, and you see there is a definite uh, deficiency. Then only we conclude that it is a prothrombotic state. So uh, rarely we see this kind of uh, cases with protein C and protein S deficiency, especially. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Professor Uma, ma'am, if you are there, I would like to ask you about this uh, iron deficiency anemia and uh, strokes. Anemia and uh, associated uh, uh, dehydration problem. We have seen cases like that. Even in severe anemia uh, of sickle cell, like that, I have seen one case. My experience in uh, stroke, uh, as a general practitioner, we get one. 
we have seen these scenarios and efficiency with the other problems in efficient yes. adding to that. So iron deficiency anemia is a standalone cause of stroke. As Namans mentioned, in stroke, we talk about risk factors rather than one single etiology. So usually you should see, uh, I think probably we should see in this aspect that once you get a risk factor, you should look for another risk factors. Uh, which one, really... one, one minute. Sir, Sir, please. Sir, please. Would you advise the evaluation of prothrombin factors, prothrombite factors, acute phase or preferably after three weeks? Uh, Ma'am, would you like to take this? So, uh, sir, during acute state, what we uh, do is a homocysteine APLA. And uh, if uh, there is a family history, then uh, or we get a hyperhomocysteinium and then MTFHR mutations during acute stage. But the uh, rest of the prothrombotic workup we uh, do after we give them LMWH for 12 weeks and then we stop it for four weeks. And then in follow-up, we do this uh, prothrombotic workup. Other than APLA homocysteine, uh, we do not do de uh, this workup during acute state. Uh, probably because uh, these factors, including protein C and protein S, are said to be falsely uh, uh, decreased due to decreased. consumption in the acute yeah. phase. So probably three months later is what is generally recommended to do these investigations. Thank you, sir, for the question and thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, this leads to another question which is quite related. Someone has asked in a child with congenital cyanotic heart disease, which is a very strong risk factor for stroke, is it still necessary to look for other risk factors? Now that we have got one very strong risk factor, should we look for other risk factors and do a prothrombotic work uh, and do the rest of the investigations which you do for a case of idiopathic ischemia? So I'll take this on, uh, question, uh, what the literature has reported. So in patients with acute, even patients with ALL, or where you have a kind of uh, uh, asparaginase is used and you have a thrombotic tendency, in those series is also in presence of an acute ischemic stroke and CSVT, about 10% patients were found to have a prothrombotic state underlying. So that is classically usually homocysteinemia or MTFHR polymorphism. So, uh, but that is a Western setting where you can do lots of workup. But uh, uh, in Indian setting where you have an identified etiology like uh, presence of cyanotic heart disease and you have hyper, uh, you have polycythemia, you have dehydration. So then it uh, uh, like... Uh, correlates with your presence of stroke in these cases. So usually we do not do uh, workup, but uh, uh, literature suggests that there can be associated uh, uh, hyperhomocysteinemia or MTFHR polymorphism in these kids. All right, ma'am. Thank you. I would like to ask Professor Lima, ma'am, also if she's around and uh, Dr. Arulmuri, sir, for your opinion on this. Uh, when you have a risk factor, particularly cyanotic heart disease, as this participants has asked, is it worthwhile considering other risk factors and evaluating? Professor Lima, ma'am, followed by Arun. The literature says the etiology for uh, pediatric stroke is uh, uh, diverse and uh, multiple risk factors. But as uh, Dr. Reno said, when we have one risk factor, usually we do not search for the other. But if the literature says it is multiple and multiple risk factors can coexist. So honestly speaking, we have to do it. But usually we are, uh, do not pursue for that. For example, if the child has a nephrotic syndrome and presents to us with a CVST, we are not proceeding further to find out the other uh, risk factors. Especially in a congenital cyanotic heart disease, what we have seen is uh, rather than polycythemia, if the child is having a low hemoglobin with associated iron deficiency, they are more prone to have a stroke. So uh, the thing is, as Renu said, uh, usually we do not uh, evaluate further. If it is an idiopathic, then uh, we are uh, we, we will be uh, having uh, starting with the cardiac evaluation. We will be proceeding one by one to find out the uh, um, what is the etiology. Whereas when we have one uh, risk factor already known, say uh, uh, systemic disease, then we are not pursuing further. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Alurmari, yes. your... Yes, madam. I fully also agree with ma'am on the same line, particularly when the treatment is not going to change by finding another uh, etiology. I think we'll keep the child under follow-up after treating the cardiac underlying cardiac condition. Thank you, sir, and thank you, ma'am, for those comments. Uh, there is uh, one question about uh, uh, CSVT with bleed in a neonate. So in the press, because we know that hemorrhagic strokes uh, lead to some amount of hemorrhage uh, uh, as a part of there, because these are wet infarcts. So should anticoagulation be started in these 
children and what are the contraindications for anticoagulation uh, renu ma'am your uh, comment on this so uh, children with the sinus venous thrombosis with hemorrhage uh, should be started on anticoagulant uh, the caveat is that that hemorrhage should be should not be very large so that is a one caveat because there there may be a chance of increase in the size of hemorrhage if you have a large hematoma uh, but if in a small uh, hemorrhagic infarct or hemorrhagic transformation usually these are not a contraindication to start them on lmwh because uh, that that is the treatment in these patients because you have to lyse the thrombosis to establish circulation uh, in presence of hemorrhage what is required is uh, you wait if Uh, for two to three days, if there is a no increase in the size of uh, hemorrhage, and uh, or there is a new onset uh, uh, neurological symptom or increase in the size of infarct, then you put them on LMWH. So initial wait for two to three days. If there is no increase in the size, then you can start. Or if you have a worsening with new infarcts or new thrombosis, then you have to start them on uh, hemorrhage. A uh, small hemorrhage, minor hemorrhages, minor hemorrhagic transformation is not a contraindication for. Uh, anticoagulation therapy so hemorrhages on mri or ct are part of the disease process yeah, in itself. pfpt so unless there is a massive midline shift or progression of uh, uh, the uh, mental uh, poor mental status of the child due to new hemorrhages probably uh, it should not be withheld which is frequently we get scared looking at hemorrhages on the ct or mri and do not give uh, heparin in these patients which is important heparin is important for these patients to prevent progression of the thrombus ma'am a related question what is the duration of anticoagulation in these children and what is the role of and timing of repeat imaging in csvt patients both in the neonatal age group as well as uh, beyond the neonatal age group okay so uh, so uh, repeat image is indicated if you have worsening or you have hemorrhage which is increasing during acute phase new onset neurological signs or encephalopathy or raised icp that is indication for image in the acute setting and but uh, if you uh, like sail off the acute phase uh, quietly and then in follow up 12 weeks uh, time is the required when you do a repeat imaging to see the recanalization happening in these kids so if by third month if you have like a recanalization reasonable or formation of collaterals so at that point you can uh, decide to stop about uh, lmwh therapy in these kids all right so uh, repeat mri at around 3 months for recanalization in those cases will be recommended all right thank you uh, i have two interesting questions so one is about perinatal stroke so what is the common etiology of perinatal stroke which we discover during the developmental evaluation of a child when there is paucity of movements on one side and then discover an old stroke in the mri so uh, what are should we investigate these children and if necessary the mothers also for a pro thrombotic state and uh, if it is detected in the neonatal period what will be the usual presentation of stroke and uh, uh, should it be treated if it is detected in the neonatal period so two questions uh, both concerning perinatal stroke uh, renu ma'am please so that perinatal stroke is all together uh, kind of uh, stuff rather than this acute stroke so etiology is usually different in these kids so first is regarding clinical presentation that is very non specific in these kids they more present with the encephalopathy or seizures focal seizures or encephalopathy rather than a deficit and uh, uh, so that's how diagnose uh, stroke in these kids if you child is presenting with seizures new onset encephalopathy and you see it an arterial uh, involvement then you, these are diagnosed with the stroke etiology of uh, perinatal stroke is altogether different from this usually they are related to maternal infection placental embolization so uh, this is a different so uh, we do see uh, pediatric cases uh, neonates with uh, uh, infarct in uh, in uh, neonatal areas or emergencies uh, where there is a infarct but usually we do not find etiology but we do investigate them with the uh, angiography because uh, uh, but uh, most of these kids uh, uh, comes after the acute presentation in follow up with the hand preference uh, with the developmental delay so at that particular time uh, work up for etiology is uh, uh, really not very helpful but if you have a strong family history or maternal uh, repeated abortions or history of uh, thrombotic disease in the family then you uh, probably investigate these kids with it. and uh, recently identification of genetic uh, uh, arteriopathies uh, in these kids has been shown to associated with hemiplegic cerebral palsy in this some of the genes are associated with the genetic arteriopathies in these kids 
So generally, when they present in infancy with uh, positive of movements as hemiplegic, evolving hemiplegic cerebral palsy, they are not extensively investigated uh, because it is said to be a transient uh, gestation-related event due to placental thrombosis and then subsequent embolization. But now, as Ma'am has rec- uh, has uh, uh, fleetingly touched upon, these are there are certain entities which have been recognized recently as uh, vasculopathies which run in the family. So when there is a strong family history or repeated occurrence of uh, uh, perinatal strokes in the family uh, it is worth investigating for these uh, uh, vasculopathies which uh, of which collagenopathies is one of the type subtype of these uh, groups ma'am my one of my last few questions uh, is one is about cns vasculitis so what is your experience when to consider this diagnosis and how to diagnose these patients and how to treat most importantly it becomes difficult to prove the diagnosis of cns vasculitis many times so how to go about this ma'am can you just throw some light briefly on cns vasculitis presenting a stroke in children uh so uh, it's a difficult diagnosis uh, we diagnose primary cns vasculitis in kids who uh, repeated episodes of infarct within a short span of time and you see uh, in angiography there is involvement of uh, large vessels if it is angiography positive that is more common as compared to the small vessel arteriopathy so we do see uh, si- simultaneous involvement of bilateral ica mc and there are no collateral formations in these kids so these kids are at risk of uh, large strokes and catastrophic presentation rather than uh, if you see with the progressive arteriopathy of moya moya where you have more subacute presentation so we have seen kids with the bilateral ica bilateral mca involvement and in the vessel wall we could show that there was a uh, multiple areas are involved we have concentric wall thickening with partial enhancement so we diagnose that's how we diagnose these kids with the uh, progressive mr ngo positive uh, uh, arteriopathy uh, small arteriopathy we hardly are able to diagnose because they require uh, because angiography cannot detect them sometime dsa is required to diagnose uh, at uh, if you have small arteries so then you can see uh, areas of uh, uh, dilatation on aneurysms or thinning so that's how we diagnose and treatment is uh, usually immunosuppressive in these kids and so we treat them with steroids and cyclophosphamide for, uh, uh, in these cases good thank you thank you for the extensive answer uh, my one uh, question is to uh, professor lima ma'am if she's around ma'am uh, we very frequently speak about metabolic strokes uh, students and residents post graduates very commonly offer them in the on the differential diagnosis so uh, Uh, in your practice in your experience how frequent are these metabolic causes of strokes and what are the clinical and radiological clues when uh, we should suspect metabolic causes for stroke uh, professor lima ma'am uh, metabolic stroke uh, uh, probably uh, you are asking about melas uh, when the infarcts are in a, uh, in a different vascular territory and uh, if there is uh, lactic acidosis or your mri shows an a lactic peak and uh, if uh, uh, right occipital region or posterior uh, region when there is an infarct in the posterior uh, region then we can think about uh, this melas but uh, in practice so far uh, we have not seen or we have not confirmed any case of melas and uh, another one is fabry fabry also does not uh, we used to see children less than 12 years only so in our hospital so we have not come across any fabry also so far and of course hyperhomocysteinemia we used to see uh, in uh, in uh, some of the children we have heard uh, homocysteine levels high more than 15 so in such cases we used to give pyridoxine in addition to our aspirin uh, apart from that i have not come across any melas or fabry so far all right ma'am so uh, among the causes probably vasculopathies are the most common uh, followed by uh, cardiac causes and then uh, coagulopathies uh, thrombophilic conditions and then probably metabolic so these are the least common uh, among the group of uh, disorders uh, my last question i would i would like to ask all our panelists opinions on this uh, what are the common mimics of strokes which occur in children which uh, residents should remember in their day to day practice and what you have come across as common uh, 
mimics of stroke so i'd uh, start with uh, arun muni sir on this uh, what are the common mimics of stroke sir you have come across in your practice and you want uh, pgs and residents to remember no i i agree with totally with what madam has extensively given in her lecture but the one other thing which i thought i will stress on is migraine childhood migraine can present with the headaches and focal neurological deficits particularly the familial hemiplegic migraine so that should be kept in mind of late we have found that particularly when there is a strong family history of migraines we should uh, get into this sort of a thing and uh, other things are like acid uh, seizures no postural tot tot spells that can mimic a stroke particularly when there's no proper good history the child wakes up with this unilateral focal neurological deficit and the seizure would have been unnoticed so that should be also be kept in mind so these okay. are some of the things which i thought i should add thank you sir But otherwise everything madam has covered yes sir uh, professor uma ma'am would you like to uh, comment on this uh, the common causes in your practice or you want residents to remember you can restress this is a thing common problem in my practice and in the hospital also as uh, dr renu madam and dr arun murli sir has said about migraine in children with a strong uh, familial uh, history what they have stressed sometimes so, a infection rarely manifest like that so encephalitis and also uh, encephalitis all that manifest thank you for thank you ma'am thanks uh, mahesh sir do you want to add uh, to this list in your practice uh, stroke mimics which you no, have no, it's already been covered by both already covered by yeah. all right so i think we have extensively covered much of this so that uh, brings me to the end of my list uh, tanguvel sir has a very few questions and some selected questions from the q and a which our participants have asked so over to you sir sir you have to unmute yourself sir you are still mute thank you madam it was a wonderful coverage that shows how much of uh, depth as well as experience you had with these kids really really dedicated work that shows a dedicated work you covered almost everything common as well as rare things stroke in child in a covid positive child have you come across any stroke during this session or last year associated with covid covid antibody is positive and then no, uh, sir, we have not uh, came across with the covid related stroke but we do see uh, four or five case reports has been published uh, in the covid associated arteriopathy one was from aims patna dr lokesh has published so in a covid positive po patient who came with the focal deficit there was a unilateral focal uh, arteriopathy so i would suggest that uh, the same uh, hypothesis is true that all the viral uh, infections can act as a trigger for vasculopathy so uh, if you research the literature uh, approximately few cases has already been reported that uh, covid associated vasculopathy can i presume that it is not common you know, because only one or one or two case report is it so madam or uh so we have seen almost uh, uh, several kids in our uh, covid area but uh, we have not came across yeah, that's uh, what we also have not uh, seen uh, uh, arteriopathy we do see encephalopathy uh, in these kids but not uh, focal deficits or arteriopathy how common you come across uh, stroke following varicella vaccine of course following varicella infection it has been reported is it possible that uh, varicella vaccine also can lead to stroke uh we have seen a varicella vasculopathy i'll just say that uh, every year we see one or two cases of varicella vas associated vasculopathy and usually we see uh, what i presented is a rarer phenomena that is posterior circulation stroke they more commonly present with anterior circulation stroke and uh, typically they have mca involvement in these kids so we do see one or two cases per year not that frequent uh, uh we have seen with the post varicella only not with the vaccine because uh, uh it is a overt uh, varicella what we have seen associated with arteriopathy but uh, I, i agree that encephalitis and cerebellitis are much more common of uh, complication of varicella rather than arteriopathy and usually arteriopathy presents in the later phase so after uh, approximately 1 month to approximately 12 months we considered that uh, these kids are at risk of development of arteriopathy uh, post varicella so in that case how do you prove that it is related to varicella vaccine or disease because back to after 12 months varicella is a common disease Yeah. How do so, you prove that it is related? Uh, so to we do uh, demonstrate IgM uh, and sometimes PCR in the CSF, but that is not a very sensitive uh, test. PCR in the later part can be negative. 
but where is the igg and igm can be present so it is a association basically what is the role of uh, aspirin in uh, sickle cell disease causing needing to stroke is there any role so it's not indicated sir you have to maintain the hemoglobin and if you develop uh, uh, like even uh, these kids get tend to develop uh, uh, moya moya disease then also the revascularization surgeries are not very effective so you have to treat them with the, uh, maintain good hemoglobin or uh, with the exchange transfusion we do not see sickle cell anemia so my uh, experience with sickle is very limited we do see more often thalassemia thalassemia with the stroke we more frequently see um, what is the role of uh, steroid as well as osmotherapy in hemorrhagic uh, stroke because that may also lead to secondary problems cerebral edema leading to secondary problem of course generally they say that mannitol is contraindicated but we can go ahead with 3% saline what is your experience what is the role of steroids uh, steroids uh, uh, as such there is no evidence for use of steroid but uh, steroid is indicated in case you have uh, like large mass effect secondary to hemorrhagic stroke in that setting it can be a life saving otherwise you have to go for evacuation or uh, hemicraniotomy in that situation usually used in small hematoma no mass effect usually steroid is not indicated in these patients uh, regarding the osmotherapy question uh, yeah 3% saline yeah, hypertonic saline yeah 3% saline versus uh, mannitol in these kids so there is a theoretical risk of a breach in the blood barrier in that particular site and mannitol related uh, uh worsening uh, can be seen but uh, there is no head to head trial or evidence in favor of each one of them but as a practice we have been uh, came from mannitol to 3% saline as in our institute because uh, we see it is a more safer and we do not see hemodynamic instability and it's easy to monitor uh, with the sodium levels so uh, so uh, i agree that there is no uh, kind of comparative uh, trials for use of but uh, uh, 3% saline is as preferred uh, modality in our uh, our institute what is the duration between trivial trauma and the development of mineralizing osteopathy uh, i think mineralizing angiopathy is present in these children before the trauma the trauma just brings them to the uh, physician so usually typically stroke develop uh, within 48 hours to 72 hours after a trivial fall or sometimes just they uh, kids fall and they cry and they just go to sleep and when they wake up you know the parent notice that there is a weakness so so this is how typically we get that uh, they fall from the bed or then they start crying and once they get up mother notice that there is a phasia or he's not speaking or there is a weakness in the arm so 24 to 72 hours is the time when uh, these uh, focal deficits is on so sometime dystonia also develops a post uh, trivial uh, fall okay. and this and probably this calcification is present before early and because of stiffness these uh, vessels break uh, tears when there is a fall because of shear injury or uh, that point of time thank you man i think we have come to the end of the questions sir shivan thank you sir i think it has been a very interesting yeah. session sir gaurish extensive coverage of stroke generally as pediatricians when now we see a child with stroke lot of uh, uh, complexities come to our mind whether to admit in icu or outside the ward then how to when to order for mri how, how safely we can do mri in acute stage nice. all these questions come to our mind you very nicely uh, uh, clear clarified everything madam it was a very very wonderful talk thank you sir oh tishwan thank you thank you ma'am i'd like to thank every one of you for uh, uh, holding till it's going to be nearly 2 hours but we didn't realize that time has passed so uh, quickly that is because of a very effective lecture and a very enriching q and a session which we had i'd like to transfer the congratulatory messages which i'm getting on our whatsapp groups and on the chat box that this was the best presentation on the pediatric stroke ever thank you ma'am one of the beautiful case series of slides which you presented is what one another candidate has said so thank you ma'am for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation and uh, spending this much of time uh, with us uh, i'd like to uh, offer my gratitude to professor uma devi ma'am who agreed at the first instance and uh, spent this much time with us uh, and contributing actively to our session so thank you ma'am i also thank uh, arun mori sir and uh, for uh, again agreeing at the very first instance and allowing us to eat up some of his uh, Uh, uh two hours of his practice time in the evening my thanks also goes to professor lima polin ma'am who joined us uh, though late she was very actively participant in our discussion thank you ma'am for that she has been very uh, uh, agreeing to uh, all our invitations till date my thanks also goes to mahesh sir to who always uh, steps in 
uh, as a chairperson and has always been with us since the last 14 sessions as a moderator. Uh, my special thanks goes to Professor G.K. Sir, who has been a very regular participant in our uh, sessions. Thank Even you. though he was in the US during the first few sessions, he used to still come and contribute and he actively used to tell me that send me invitations, I'll, used to, I'll, I'll, I'll try to come during uh, all sessions. Probably one or two he has missed but he has uh, uh, clogged more than 90% attendance in our sessions and we are very grateful to Sir for his contribution. So my, I thank everyone of you and wish you a good night and thank Ma'am again for a very wonderful and effective enriching lecture. We had uh, uh, learned so much during this two hour period. So thank you everyone and good night. Uh, see you next week in the next session. Thank, thank you. you Shivan and thank you uh, everybody. Thank it you. was a wonderful session and I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Shivan, for this. Thank you, ma'am. We enjoyed it and benefited very much. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much.